It's like, well, but you better, right? You better make sure that you go out, get her some flowers, make sure you take her out to dinner today. That's what we're supposed to do. But actually, every day is a love day if you're a believer, right? Every day. As a matter of fact, we have the gift of love right here. This is God's message to the world. You know what this is? This is a Valentine's Day card to the world right here. Hallelujah. God is so good. God is so awesome. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, that's, that's, the, that's the ultimate love letter. That's the ultimate love that anyone can give. Jesus even said that, the, that, that uh, no greater love is there than one who lays their life down for another. Hallelujah. And you think about that. You know, it's just like how someone can lay their life down for another. Not everybody's going to lay their life down for anybody, really, if you think about it. But there is one area, there is one place where somebody will lay their life down and that's in the area of marriage. That's in the area of husband and wife, right? I mean, I, I, I would lay my life down for my wife and for my kids, for my family, and I'm sure you would too. You know, that's, that's the only area that somebody will really lay their life down. I mean, maybe some for, you, know, you go into the military, but they won't willingly lay their life down for anybody, but that, that's what Jesus did for us. He laid his life down for us. Wow, what kind of love that is. And it makes you think about marriage, doesn't it? Because why did God even institute marriage? Well, we know it's, you know, so that we could have little Adams and little Eves running around. Okay, I get that. But that's not really the main reason. The main reason God created marriage was for love, relationship. Nothing to do with female and female, but everything to do with how he responds to us and how he wants us to respond back to him. And so we're going to look into that this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so I want to talk a little bit about Genesis, because everything begins in the word of Genesis. Everything begins in the beginning. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, why is that so important? Because when God presented Eve to Adam, and he's, Adam said to him, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She's going to be called woman because she has come out of man. Do you know that when, Adam, when God introduced Adam and Eve together, there was an instant bond. It was like they, 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 there was a love for each one of them that was just beyond expectation. Remember, they didn't even know sin back then. All they knew was love, and all they knew was God's love. Can you imagine the intensity of the love that must have come from them too when they first came together? The intensity of them just loving one another. Adam wanted to protect her and keep her safe. I mean, that was his world, you know? God was his world, and she was his world because they were together. It was as of one. That's why God brought them two together to be one. But isn't it amazing the love that they must have felt when they came together? And, you know, when you look through the Bible, the theme of the bride the theme of the bridegroom, the theme of marriage, you can see all through the Word of God. And so I'm going to talk, to, uh, talk to, from that perspective today about God's Word. Hallelujah. God had a plan, and the plan was, for, it was about relationship, a very special relationship, one that reflected the kind of love that God has for us, built around a bridegroom and a bride. Hosea 2.19 says, God says about his people, now his people is us today, right? We're, we're God's people, but he's speaking back then in the Old Testament to his people, and he says this. He says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and in mercy. And today we can see this betrothal of Jesus. And so my key verse this morning is... Uh, in Isaiah 62, 5, which says, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. How a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. You know what that tells us? That tells us that he sees us as a bride with a bridegroom. And without a bridegroom, there is no relationship. We can't see God unless we have a bridegroom. 
right? Isn't that what Jesus died on the cross for us for? So that we could be reunited back with the Father? So without the bridegroom, there, the, 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 then we, we, keep, we, don't have, we don't have the Father. We, don't, we can't see the Father. We need a bridegroom to know the Father. Jesus connects us to him by no man comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. And so we want to see here how this revelation opens up to the kind of relationship God wants with his church for his son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus said in Matthew 22, 2, that the kingdom of heaven is like a king prepared, uh, uh, who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Now, the king is God. We know Jesus is talking about himself. The king is God, and the bridegroom is his son for the wedding banquet that he's preparing for. And Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom four times in the Gospels. Matthew 9, 15, he's, re he's referred to as the bridegroom by uh, when, his, when John's disciples were uh, commenting to Jesus that his, his, his people, his disciples, don't, they don't fast. Why don't they fast? And Jesus said, why would you fast when the bridegroom is here? When the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast. So Jesus is referring, he's the bridegroom. Matthew 22, 1 through 14, the parable of the father holding the wedding feast for his son. Again, that's the father God, and that's the son, Jesus Christ. We're talking again, he's a bridegroom in this passage. This is what he's talking about. In Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the story of the ten virgins. Uh, five, uh, five didn't make it, and five received Jesus. Who? The bridegroom. They were waiting for the bridegroom to come. So in each one of these instances, Jesus was talking about himself as a bridegroom. John puts out, in uh, John 3.29, points to Jesus as the bridegroom as well. And he says that the bride belongs to the bridegroom in John 3.29. Again, his disciples, John's disciples are coming to him and they're saying, listen, you know, uh, that guy that you pointed to us the other day, that's Jesus. Everybody's going to him. Everybody's flocking over to him. And John says in this, paragraph, in this, uh, in this scripture, he says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. See, John's the forerunner. He's, he's the one announcing the bridegroom to the world. He's announcing the bridegroom to his disciples and the people that are there willing to listen. That's what, that's what John is doing. So you can, in essence, say, John is the best man. And now when you come to the baptism of John, here he is getting baptized. Here comes Jesus. He comes for the first time. He's getting baptized by John. And here we have John, the best man, saying, here's the bridegroom. Here is the bridegroom that I was telling you about. And the bridegroom comes in, Jesus. He goes down. The witness comes. The Holy Spirit comes down upon, on, onto Jesus. The Father announces his approval for him from a voice from heaven. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. You got the whole family right there. You got all the witnesses right there. You got the best man there. You got all of the bridal parties there. Everybody's there at the baptism. It's like a big wedding. It's, you know, when you, when you start looking at the word of God from a lens of, of from a bride, looking at a bridegroom, and you start looking at it from that, from, that, uh, from that perspective, you start to see things that fall into place and start making sense. That it's more than just Adam and Eve coming together as a husband and wife. It's God showing a relationship that he wants with his people. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So this morning, I want to talk to you about how God sees us through the eyes of a bride. This is the perspective of looking at God's bridegroom through the eyes of the bride. And this is, a, this is what is called a bridal paradigm. That's what this is, a bridal paradigm, a way to look at uh, the, the bridegroom through the bride's eyes. Seeing Jesus as our bridegroom gives us insight to who we are in him as a cherished bride. The truth of our identity is seen in seeing his identity, knowing that will transform us. If he is the bridegroom, then us as the bride have a lot to be excited about because the highest level of relationship you can have is a marriage. That's the biggest relationship you can have with your husband and wife is, is when you're married, that's, the, that's a relationship that God wants to have with us. And so no wonder he uses marriage as that relationship. It's intimacy with God. That's what he's talking about. He's saying that Jesus wants a personal, intimate relationship with him, not just as a friend, but as a loving partner to share everything together. He wants to be married to us as a husband and wife kind of relationship. 
But when you study the scriptures through the eyes of the bride, all of a sudden these scriptures, you start to notice them, especially the scriptures about the bride and the bridegroom and, and, uh, and Adam and Eve in the garden. And you start to see the correlation of everything coming together, how Jesus is uh, the, uh, the, the uh, um, Adam and Eve are actually like a foreshadow of Christ in the church. So let me show you how the bride sees. Uh, um, I, I want to show you how, what the bride sees. Let's talk about the bride and her purpose. What is the purpose of the bride? Now we're speaking of, uh, about us, of course, the church. We're the bride. God's eternal purpose for his church, you and me, is to rule and reign with his son in heaven forever. That's God's ultimate plan. That's his ultimate purpose. He wants us all to be together in heaven with his son, ruling and reigning over all the earth. So he created us in his likeness and image. Now I want to come back to that. Why did God create us in his likeness and image? Think about this. We're the only ones that God actually created. In, we're the only ones. Not the angels. They didn't have this. Only us did God create in his image because we are created so that we can... We can, we can uh, communicate, we can, it's not just our communication though, it's our emotions, it's our creativity, it's our ab abilities. God gave us everything we need to know to come into a deep relationship with him. And we're the only ones that have that. We are in what I would call a position of privilege. Amen. A position of privilege. And I wanna read something to you. People don't know what this means. 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are, chosen, we are chosen people and God's special possession. Even the angels never experience these things that we have access to. The angels will never call God Father, and no angel will ever call Jesus Lord or be part of the bride of Christ. They only can come as close to, they can only come so close to him. The only ones that can come close to God, that close to God, is the church. The church and only we the church can come that close only man through the Bible can come close to God that close to God hallelujah but check this out the angels even the angels were so curious about this new creation that God made you know I can imagine the angels sitting around and looking at God creating this and they're like what is he doing what is he doing the angels did I mean God always does everything great and wonderful so they're all excited because God's about to do something new again and they're looking and they see him and he's like I don't know look at that is he he's, he's playing in the dirt down there I don't know what he's doing and all of a sudden he, he starts to see something up here and they're like look at this guy he, 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 he looks a lot like God he looks a lot like God and his, you know God created man in his image and, and, and in his likeness and they're saying, whoa, what, are they, what is he doing? What is he doing? And he starts to formulate man, and then he breathes into the, into the, into the man, and, and the spirit goes in, and man comes to life. Can you imagine the billions and billions of angels? They've never seen anything like this. To them, this was a whole new thing for them. This, what is God doing? And they were very curious. And so when you look back, even the prophets, when they were prophesying about Jesus, they weren't prophesying for themselves. They were prophesying because they knew that Jesus, there was one coming, the Messiah was coming, he was going to go through sorrows, and they, they knew that, as a matter of fact, let me read the passage. It's in 1 Peter 1.12, it says, it was revealed to them, talking about the prophets now, okay, this is Peter talking about the prophets, and he says, it is revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. In other words, they were out there prophesying that this Messiah was going to come, but they knew it wasn't coming in their time. They knew it was coming in the time way before. And so what Peter is telling them is they were prophesying, not for them, but so that we would be watching out, so that we would see when he's going to come. We want to make sure that they see that this is what he's going to come. This is what it's going to look like. This is how you're going to know it's him. And we want you to make sure they're watching that. And you know who else was doing that? The angels. Even the angels. Look at what 1 Peter 1.12 says. It says, even the angels will never experience these things that we have access to. It says, uh, oh, I'm sorry. 112 tells us that even the angels will never experience these things. The angels will never call God Father. Let me just, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. Okay. In fact, the angels desire to look into the gospel and our relationship with God. Peter 112 says, tells us that, but they will never experience him as we can. Uh, it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of 
the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then it says this, even angels long to look into these things. Even the angels are excited for us. They want to know what we're going to do. They want to know, now they see what God has been doing. They see this new creation coming up and now here we are as, uh, as people in the image and likeness of God and they know what God is doing. They say he's just like God. They made man just like God and they're excited for us because they want to see what we're going to do. They want to see what God's going to do. So even the angels were interested in what was going to happen when Jesus came. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we, we have... Uh, Praise God. And then it says, even the angels long to look for these things. Therefore, with minds are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. We have such a position of privilege here. I mean, we have the Holy Ghost in us. How much more privilege than that can you get? We have the things. We are able to come up against the enemy. The enemy cannot attack us. We have power. We have authority. We have the ability. But more than that, we have the ability to love God for who he is. But to love him in a way that you can't even imagine. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But this is, this is, uh, and so... History begins in the garden with Adam and Eve joined together as a bridegroom and a bride in Genesis 2.24 and it's ending with a prepared bride being presented to God's worthy son in Revelation 19.7. This is the whole reason for his creation. It is his eternal purpose for the church and Jesus to unite as one and rule and reign over the heavens and the earth forever. That's the eternal purpose. That's, his, that's the purpose. And as a bride, as a bride, we all on an individual basis, is to have a personal interaction with the bridegroom. That's why it's not about, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. That's what God meant. That's why, I mean, everything God does is about relationship. When you go through the word and you see how, how the word pulls this up, Jesus taught us this on the parable of the message of the ten virgins. Each had a lamp representing their individual ministries and relationship with God. Some had oil representing the anointing of the Holy Spirit on their ministries, but some had no anointing. Their oil ran out. Their ministries were drying up. They weren't succeeding. They were just going through the motions. They, would, uh, they, weren't, they weren't relating with God the way they should be. They haven't been up on their prayer life. They haven't been reading God's word. They've just been kind of lackadaisical and they've been kind of re relying on other people. Oh, I'm, you know, my ministry is really doing bad. You got to help me. Please pray for my ministry. It's not doing so well. Well, maybe it's not doing so well because in that ministry, whoever that is, isn't getting anointed, isn't looking for God's oil. He's not looking for the Lord. He's being, he's being uh, lazy. He's being uh, compromising. He's not, he's not preaching the word. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's no longer uh, looking for Jesus as his first love, but as his second. And we have to be so careful about that, especially in today's days. The oil is so low on so many people today. And so they cry out to give us some of your oil. Give us some of your anointing. I know you, you see God. You know God. I've heard that actually. Well, I know you know the Lord and I know that you, know, you pray all the time. So could you pray for me? But they're praying for an anointing. They're praying for, for, for the oil. They're praying for the oil from, from, from you. They're praying for the oil from you that are anointed. They want oil from you. And they say, oh, but they come to him in the, in the parable with the virgins. They go over to the, to the five that, that had oil and said, give us some of your oil. No, they said, well, you go out, go out and get your own. And people look at that and say, well, that's not a very nice person. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they just give him some oil? They got extra oil. Well, the thing they don't understand is that only God can give you that oil. Only Jesus can give you that anointing. No man can give you anointing. No pastor can give you anointing. No, no, no mom or dad is going to be able to give you an anointing. Only Jesus. He's the only one. And how do you get that anointing? By being in the Word. By studying out Scripture. By going into prayer. By being involved. To live that kind of a life. Hallelujah. God is the only one who can give us that oil. The Holy Spirit. An individual transaction between you and Jesus. It's a personal interaction. Hallelujah. You have to seek him daily, not on and off, not once in a while, not Christmas and Easter, but daily, Amen. daily. And more than ever, now we need to be ready. We need to be ready. 
Jesus has a message for us. And the message is very, very simple. Very simple message. On the evening before the cross, uh, Jesus was in, the, was in the garden. And remember when he was in the garden and he was just before the cross and he was praying and he was saying, Father, if this cup could pass by me, you know, but then let your will be done and not my own. Well, I believe the reason he said that is because of the prayer that he did just a few hours earlier. It might have even been in the garden. I don't know. But it might have even been in the garden. There was that prayer in chapter 17, in Matthew 17. That pretty much that whole chapter is all Jesus' prayer, just before he goes into that mode. And he prays something in there that's very telling of Jesus' desire for us. And he says this, and I believe this is what caused him to say, you know what, God? Let your will be done and not mine. Because he remembered this encouraging prayer that he prayed the night, uh, just a few hours earlier. And he said this in uh, John 17, 24. He said, Father, I desire, desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Do you know how huge that is? He's saying, Father, the people that you gave me, those that have, this is what I did for you. I'm done. I finished everything that I have. My desire is finally going to come to pass. The gift that you're giving me, the people that you promised to me, these people are going to be, this is my desire with me, to be with me where I am, they will be also. That was a desire that Jesus had. And the Father's like, I know, I know, don't worry about it. That's what you're here for. That's what you're doing, son. You finished everything. Now we just got to seal this thing up on the cross. Everything's been put in place. Jesus ministered. He's, he's courted his bride. He's wooed his bride to him. He's spoken to them about his word, about the power that they're going to have when he leaves, about the love of the Father. That was the whole message, the love of the Father for the church. And that was what Jesus' message was all about is his desire to be with us so we can rule and reign together. That's the whole ultimate goal of what life is all about. Hallelujah. And so he's crying out to God. In fact, years later, in Revelation 21, God tells, uh, the, uh, Jesus tells the angel, listen, you got to go over and talk, you got to talk to, uh, you got to talk to John for me over there. He's, I got him writing Revelation right now. And, there's a, and I want you to make sure that he gets this in Revelation 21. Of course, I'm just adding to this story, but the point is, is that Jesus is telling him that he has a message that he wants to give his people to ensure them that they will make it to where he is. Amen. All he has to do is what Revelation 21 commands, what, what uh, Revelation 21 says, which is, tell him this, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And I like to put it in that way because this is how the, the Bible tells it. And so he's not saying that you, if you overcome, you can sit next to me in my throne, that you would be at my right hand. What he's saying is he's saying that you will be on the throne with me, meaning we are going to be ruling and reigning with him. He's not just going to say, listen, uh, uh, I, I, I want you to do this, that, and the other thing. And uh, after you get done with that, listen, after the, when the millennial's over, we'll get back together again and we'll compare notes. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying we're going to rule and reign together. We're going to interact together. He's going to see our heart. We're going to see his heart. We're going to be like, oh, you know what, Jesus, I was thinking of doing this for Long Island because I know that they're hurting on this and that. And he'll say, oh, that's it, brother. That's your, that, you know what, that is your heart. That's how, that's what, that's how Jesus is going to work with us because we're going to be so in love with him and he's going to be so in love with us we're going to be working together as a husband and wife really right kind of like you know everything I have is yours and everything she has is mine you know what I mean it's it's a it's a give and give relationship back and forth oh hallelujah God is so good that is huge I mean we're going to be ruling right on the throne with him I'm not saying everybody's going to be up there and you're going to have everybody crowded into Jesus' seat, you know, trying to be, well, there's, you know, there's millions of people, right? Billions of people. No, I'm just saying that we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. And it's going to be an interaction like a, like a, like a husband and wife. And, oh, you know what I'm doing today? Yeah, that sounds great. Oh, what are you doing? Building each other up and, and doing amazing things. Oh, it's going to be an exciting time. And so Jesus, 60 years later, makes sure that John gets that message from the angel. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to interact 
with each other. That's right, we're going we're gonna to have a, we're going to interact with Jesus. Jesus wants that intimacy with us. God wants that intimacy with us. And so we, we are built. As a matter of fact, it is, it's through Jesus that we have a spiritual intimacy with God. The fact that God created man in his likeness and image proves that he has a deep re- desire for a relationship with us. Just the fact that he created us the way he did proves that that's what God's ultimate purpose is, a deep desire for his people and intimacy. Oh, hallelujah. God made man so he could pour out his love on us, but more than that, he created man to have the capacity to show the same kind of love back to him. We can show the same kind of love that God gives us back to him. And people will say, oh, no, that's, that's impossible. That, you, that you, you know, the kind of love that God gives... Listen, yes, he does give a very, very powerful love, more than you will ever know, and more than we can even fathom here on earth. We will there. Down here, it's it's not as easy. But we do have the capability to do that. It's in our DNA. Hallelujah. I want to show you how God shows us this intimate relationship between marriage. Back in the garden, we can see... What is concealed in the garden is revealed in Christ, okay? Genesis 2.24 says, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, there's two words here that I want to, I want to, two good key points that I want to point out here. Leaving and joined. Leaving, Jesus left everything. In uh, Philippians 2 Uh, Philippians 2, I think it was 6 through 8, Jesus, remember when he was, uh, when he, when he, he stepped out of humanity, I mean, he stepped out of eternity and he stepped into time, he stepped into humanity, he left everything behind, everything Jesus was, here's our all powerful God and he left everything to come to us, to come to earth, to be a bond servant to his father. That's what Jesus did for us. And then he died on the cross. He did everything for us. He poured out his life for us, literally, to the cross. Everything Jesus did was for us. And so my question to you is, shouldn't we be giving everything back to him? But yet we, well, I can't can't talk about God right now because it's going to take too much time. Or, uh, you know what, I I, I got other things to do right now. But but I I, I have devotional time with the Lord, yes. Uh, But uh, he understands. God understands. Well, here's what Jesus says about that in Luke 14, 26. In the same way, Jesus calls us and you to me to his, he calls us to to be his bride. Uh, It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life too, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 16. So what is Jesus saying? You got to hate your parents. You got to hate your kids. You got to hate. No. No. The whole Bible talk is about love. And Jesus even says you got to love your enemy if you want to take it that far. That's just, that's, everything is about love with Jesus. So he's not saying that. But what he is saying is that if, you're, if your mother or your father or your kids or your uh, curriculum or your school or your whatever it is takes you away from me, then you need to get rid of it. You, can't, you have to... You have, to, you have to be with me. It has to be a one-on-one relationship with me. I gave you everything, and I expect everything back from you. Now, I'm not saying that if you know you're, we all know sometimes we go back to the family or we go to our friends or coworkers and we get the eye roll, you know, that's always, you know, oh, talking about the Lord again, you know what I'm saying? But it's not, but it doesn't take you away from Jesus. That's the whole point, is that whatever we do, we do it unto the Lord, like it says in Colossians, right? Everything you do, do on, is if it's unto the Lord. Everything we're doing is unto the Lord, whether you're at work, whether you're in a soccer game. You can do things for the Lord, even though you're, you're in, you know, playing with the things that you do, you know, your sports or whatever it is. You can still do, you can, you, anything you do. You know, it's, I, so I want to say so much here, but I think that the crux of it is, is that when you're doing something, and you love doing it, 
As long as you're doing it with the Lord in mind, meaning that you know that you're not doing anything bad, you're not, uh, you're not betting or you're not stealing or you're not uh, being selfish, you're not doing, you know, you're doing everything in love. I mean real love the way God tells it, because sometimes people's love is like, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. But the bottom line is, is that it's in love. Then you're not taking your time away from Jesus. He's still first in your life. That's what he's talking about. And that's what he expects with us. Joined. will be joined with his wife and they will become one flesh. The same thing with Jesus and us, the church. We, the church, are joined to Christ as one. Everything we do is for the Lord. We're on, we, we, we are together with Jesus in everything that we do. It includes our loving partnership in every area of our life with our body, soul, and mind. We're linked up to Jesus. Your heart, your finances, your helps, your ministries, whatever it is that you're doing, it's all under God's domain. It's all with Jesus in mind. It's all everything you're doing. You become one. That's what happens. When you're doing these things and you're going out and you're, 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 you're doing the things of the Lord, you're reading your words, you're, you're staying close to God, you're, you're honoring people the way you're supposed to, you're living the righteous life. This is all part of being joined together as one with Christ. And that's what he's saying. Hallelujah. It's the whole bridegroom message. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. That's his message, a call to intimacy with our God. We need to understand the enormity of God's love towards us. God's love towards us. Do you even know how much God loves you? I mean, we were talking a little bit about that earlier, but I don't think I emphasized it enough. The enormity of God's love for his people is beyond. If you can think of somebody in your life right now that you love so much, you would die for that person, that you love that person so much. Maybe it's a, it's a little infant baby, maybe it's your daughter, maybe it's a, a husband, a spouse, a friend, whatever, whoever it is. Just think about that person that is so ingrained in your mind that you just love that person so much. God loves you even a hundred million times more than that. This is the, the enormity of God's love. And I'm going to prove it to you. You say, well, nobody can love me like that. I mean, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm not a very lovable person. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I don't think God loves me that way. You know, God's really mad with me right now because I'm not doing this. Or God's really sad because I'm doing, no, God is not mad. God loves you. No matter what you're going through, you know, when you're walking into things of God, it's like, oh, you know, all of a sudden, I, I shouldn't have done this thing. God's not up there saying, that's it. Okay, I've had enough of you. You're, you know what? Kick him off to the side. He ain't going to make it. That's not what God's doing. He's looking at, oh, look at it, look at it. He fell over here. <laughs> look at that. He fell. Oh, he failed in that thing. You know what? That's okay. He'll get up. I, I know his timeline. He'll, he'll get up. Yeah, he'll do good over here. Don't worry. He, he's one of my favorites right there, you know. He, he loves you. He, he's, he's delighted in you. He's happy with you. He's not looking to criticize you. He's not looking to, you know, oh, he's going through this thing down here. Oh, he'll be all right. He's okay. Yeah, that's, what, that's, that's God. That's, that's how he feels about us. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, Scripture tells us in John 15, 9, it says, this is what Jesus said. Jesus' words. He said, as the Father loved me, how much does the Father love Jesus? Can you even imagine that? I mean, that kind of love, wow. And Jesus says, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Can you imagine the enormity of that? Jesus loves us the way the Father loves Jesus. That's huge. That's, see, you can't, you, you can't fathom that. You know, when, when you hear that, it's like, oh, it, it sounds impossible. But Jesus said it. Jesus doesn't lie. He can't lie. Jesus is love. Do you know that that's the only way he can be? Jesus can only love. God is love. That's why we, we say that. God is love. That's all he is. That's all he knows how to do is love. People sometimes take judgment that comes down on us is, is the, you know, the wrath of God. I mean, it is a, it is a wrath in a form, a, but, but it's, a, it's a judgment. It's a love that God has. He's not going to allow things that are wicked. He's not going to allow evil. Those things he, he judges on is because of his justice. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 3.18 says this, you may be, so that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know, meaning to experience, 
to experience the love, the affections of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. He wants us to know that fullness and filled. He wants to know that, that love that he has for us, and he wants us to know that. And so he tells us that he loves us just as the Father loves him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so awesome. Mm. Satan's strategy. Okay, this is a very important subject to know because Satan obviously is out to kill anything that has to do with the love of Christ. That's his whole reason for even existing is to try to destroy God's kingdom, to try to take it over and be the number and be God in the world, which will never happen. I don't know why he keeps trying, but it'll never happen. But the point is, is that he does everything in his power. He knows the Bible better than we do. He knows how to deceive. He knows how to take little things and twist them into things that don't belong. Think about this for a second. That marriage is the most attacked institution that we have today. Why is marriage the most attacked institution today? I mean, if you ask, you ask kids coming out of college today, you say, where did marriage originate? They don't know. They say, oh, it was a tradition that was from years ago. Uh, I don't know, some pope probably started it or something. They don't even know. And they'll look at it and they'll say, well, that's why it's too antiquated and it's old and, you know, we just don't do that anymore. We just live together and, you know, we, we, we don't do those things anymore. That's, that's, you, know, you got to get with the times. No, marriage was, a, was, a rigid, that got, was God's plan the whole time because it was a relationship that he was trying to in, in, embed in us. That kind of a relationship, not a kind where you live together and say, well, I'm tired of you now. So it has been six years. You're, you're gone. I, I, I'm tired. I need somebody else. No, that's not what it's about. It's about love and commitment to that person. When that person hurts, you hurt. When that person does great, you, you're doing great. You want to tell them their successes. They want to tell you their successes. You want to build them up. You're doing a great job. That's what marriage is all about, building one another up. It's having that relationship. Somebody comes in front of your wife. You're the first one in front saying, you're not going to. No, you have no right to her. You stay away from her. I will protect you. And if, you and, and if it comes to the point where you have to defend her with your life, then you defend her with your life. That's what it's, a marriage is all about. But today, it's society. It's, you know, it's just a, a hindrance to a lot of people. And then some of them get married. Oh, yeah, I believe in marriage <clears throat> and prenuptials. <clears throat> no, everything belongs to each other. That's what Jesus demonstrated to us. I gave you everything, and I expect everything. Right. Hallelujah. Marriage is, a, is attacked hard. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus, that we have the, you know, the, the beautiful thing is that even though the, de the devil uses deception, Jesus lets, a no lets us know about these deception. He tells us that there's going to be many false prophets that are going to deceive many. He tells us to be careful in Luke 21 where he says, or your hearts will be weighed down with the carousing and drunkenness and anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap for it will come on all those who live on the face of the earth. We're all going to come into these temptations. There's no way that you can't. I don't care how anointed you are, temptations are going to come into your life. And it's how you react to those temptations. I like one commentator said, lust yielded to becomes a habit. And a habit not resisted becomes a necessity. So you could be doing something that you're not doing. Maybe you're looking at something on the, on the internet you're not supposed to look at, and maybe it was by accident, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, you, you look at it again in the second time, and then the third time, and the next thing you know, it just keeps building and building. You're not resisting that habit. You're not taking away that habit from your eyes. You're just keep continuing in with it. Every day becomes a necessity. Now you can't live without it. Now you have to, have a, you have to pop a pill. You have to drink a drink. You have to look at another show, whatever it is. If a habit is not resisted, it becomes a necessity. But Jesus did not leave us defenseless. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus wants us to be aware of the enemy and his attacks. And he gave us weapons to fight back. I mean, all of Ephesians with all of the armor of God that we have. I mean, he's given us the ability. We got the Holy Spirit when he left. There's nothing that we cannot come against and beat in the name of Jesus. 
Hallelujah. He's given us the authority, the same authority Jesus had on the earth, we have also. He has not left us defenseless. We have weapons. We, our weapons may not be carnal. They're weapons that are in the spirit. We don't see them, but we have them. And we need to understand how to use them. I have a mustard seed and I know how to use it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Jeremiah, 2 Corinthians 6, 7 says, By truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for your right hand and for your left. Jeremiah 1.10 says, See, I have set you this day over the nations and kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build, to plant. Jesus has given us this authority and we can do that. We can dismantle the wicked's kingdom just with our words, just with our actions. 2 Corinthians 10.4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy all strongholds. Hallelujah. And so what is the bride's response? What is our response to this message? Revelations 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself perfect, made herself ready. John emphasized the role of the individual believer, uh, believer's free will and to choose. Okay, so... We are to make ourselves ready by agreeing with him in our character, our understanding, and our service. So the bridegroom's response to the bridegroom, the church's response to Jesus, is to trust his plan and judgments. Trust what he's doing. The judgments that he makes in your life is for, your, is for love. He, what he, he knows what he's doing in your life. So we need to trust his plans and his judgments. We need to believe that all things are ordered by God for his groom. Everything God is doing is about the eternal purpose, right? Us being with the Lamb of God in heaven, ruling and reigning with Him. And so everything that's happening is ordered by God. He's already planned it out before the foundations of the earth. Rejoice and be glad of the coming celebration. Rejoice in that because it is coming. It's a guarantee. When God says, thus saith the Lord, that's a guarantee. That means it's coming. Hallelujah. And strive with all your might to live righteously, to be able to make it to that celebration. That's how you, you'll know if you're going to make it or not. We, we know when we're doing something wrong, and we know when we're doing something right. You'll feel that on the inside. You get that check that uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin always talks about, that you know what you're doing is the right thing that you're doing. And you'll also get that check that says, mm -mm, what are you doing? And you'll know that too. So strive with all your might to live righteously to be able to make it to the celebration. Thank, uh, and, and that you make yourself ready each and every day. Every day, we always have to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do, that we're doing the righteous thing, that you're reading your word on a regular basis. Maybe you're doing your devotions, uh, you're into prayer, you know, you're going to church, you're fellowshipping with the brethren, you're getting involved. This is all part of getting ready every, on a daily basis. That sounds like a lot when you first hear it from here, but it's really not. If you think about it, because if you think about what you are doing on a daily basis, you'll see a lot of things can be replaced. A lot of things that you're doing, you're like, well, what am I doing this for, really? Because it's not, there's, there's, there's nothing good in what I'm doing. It's a, it's, it's a matter of fact, I know the Lord doesn't like it. And so you replace those things with things that are good, better habits. Believe that, you, that, you, believe that your life of righteousness will be celebrated by Jesus on that day. And it will. When you're in the things of God, you are guaranteed, guaranteed to overcome and be on the throne, as Revelation 3.21 says, with Jesus. Revelation 22.17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Oh, praise the Lord. In that time of coming persecution against Christianity and church, the bride cries, come. We're in that position right now. Jesus can come at any moment. He could come before I even finish this message. He could come at any time. And hopefully we'd all disappear and we'd all be with Christ. We're all saying right now, come. Even the earth is crying out for Jesus. Come, Lord, come. Everything is crying out for the Lord to come now. Hallelujah. And the hearts of God's people always should be in a ready mode to go. You know, just like the Israelites were back in Moses' time when they had to eat the, uh, the, the, the feast. 
and they had to be ready with the shoes on their feet and their, their tunics tucked in and their staff in their hand. They had to be ready to go at a moment's notice and God was going to lead them out of Egypt. That's how we are right now. We need to be ready at a moment's notice. God can come any time. You know, people say, oh, I got time. No, you don't. You don't have any time left. We are right there. We are in the end days right now. There's a time that's going to be here very shortly and we need to be ready for it, church. We need to be ready for it. And I'm encouraging you to, if you're not, get ready. If your oil is low, start to fill it up because it's going to need to be filled. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. The, the, the other five virgins got complacent, lazy, and so they didn't even bother to find, that, to find more oil. They put Jesus second in their life and they took him out of first place. So what is the celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb? It occurs obviously right after the rapture. Praise God, I can't wait for that day. Hallelujah. Revelation, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Hallelujah. That's Revelation 19.7. Jesus talks about this uh, celebration in Matthew 22 with the parable of the, the certain king who arranged a marriage for his, for his son. Jesus is talking about the supper. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Luke 14 15 and 17, uh, again, he's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's inviting the people, going to the highways and byways. Those that don't, you know, they, whether they're good or bad, give them an invitation to come. Revelation 19, 6 through 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Hallelujah. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts, the righteous acts of the saints. That's where you're going to see all your righteous acts in your white linen. Hallelujah. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. The true sayings of God. Other translations, Thus saith the Lord. When God says, when you hear when any scripture in the verse, when, where God acknowledges it and says, thus saith the Lord, that's it. It's a guaranteed. It's done. It's finished. There's nothing more that can be said. God said it. You've got to believe it because that's, that's what's going to happen. And thus saith the Lord. So this is all going to happen. Hallelujah. Amen. But now I want to show you something that's so cool that maybe you didn't know. The marriage supper of the Lamb was prophesied like 700 years before Christ was even born. There's a banquet on the mountain. As a matter of fact, let me read this verse to you. And as Isaiah, it's found in Isaiah 25, starting in verse 6. It says, The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces and marrow, and refined aged wine. He's talking about the Supper of the Lamb. That's what he's talking about in that verse right there. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And he's talking about the finest foods, the aged wine. Everything is the best, the best. Because that's what we're going to have when we, come to, when we come to Jesus. When we, as the bride, comes to our bridegroom, we're going to have the best of everything. And that's what he's saying in this passage. Then he's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Verse 7. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples, even the veil which is stretched out over all the nations. He's going to lift the veil off of the people. He's going to destroy all the evil and everything that's going to go. The church is going to be revealed. We are going to be revealed to the world as clean and spotless. And God's going to take out all evil. No more abortions. No more. All of this nonsense that's going on in the, in the world today. No more bad government. Nothing. Everything is going to be taken away. We're going to have a government of God. And there's going to be prayer back in school. There's not going to be abortions anymore. There's going to be. Uh, it, it's. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm getting ahead of myself. Very say he will here's here's the confirmation he will swallow up death for all time and the lord will wipe away the tears away from the faces and he will remove the reproach of his people from all of the earth for the lord has spoken and god has put his seal on this promise with this statement thus saith the lord this means this is a guarantee Hallelujah. So the banquet at the mountain in Isaiah 25, 6. The veil is going to be lifted in Isaiah 25, 7. Death will be no more in Isaiah 25, 8. No more tears in Isaiah 25, 8. And no more rebuke in 25, 8. Everything about the marriage supper of the Lamb, that's it right there. 
That's revelation right there. 700 years by Isaiah before it even happens. Revelation 19.9, and he said unto me, write this, blessed are those who are called or invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true words or sayings of God. He said it, and I believe it. Hallelujah, praise God. We need to see God through the eyes of a bride to understand the width, the depth, the height and the, of his love. And we need to love the same way back. And we can. You can't say God doesn't love me now because you know he loves you and you know how much he loves you. So you can't say, well, you know what? I can't love like that back. No, but you can love. And you know what? When you're doing little things for the Lord and, and God looks back down on you and he, he's saying, oh, look at what he's doing down here. Look, he's praying. He's praying for me. He's praying to me. Look at it. That is so awesome. You know, whatever he wants, he's going to get. Because he asked me, I'm his father. I'm going to give it to him. That's how he's looking at you. He's delighted in you. He's delighting in you. You're his Hephzibah. Hephzibah. That's, uh, that means uh, in Hebrew that uh, she is delighted. She is, you know, he delights in her. She, she, that's what that means. She. And he uses that word, Hephzibah, because she is referring to the bride. Hallelujah. It's, so let's recap the bridal paradigm. And as I read, please, say where, please see where you fit in. Are you doing these things? It's an invitation to the intimacy with God. Are you accepting this? The intimacy with God, are you doing that? Look back and see what you're doing on a daily basis. Are you being intimate with your God? And intimate has nothing to do with female and, and, and male relation. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the type of relationship that God wants with us. It is a call to the church to experience his emotions, his love for you. Are you experiencing his emotions for his love with you? You know, when I, last night when I was in prayer, I had the praise and worship on. And I was sitting there praying and I'm praying and praying. And all of a sudden, this wave came over me. And I was just like, oh, my Lord, it's, it's you. You know, like I could just feel the love of God coming down on me. I just completely stopped in my prayers because I was asking for a million things. And I just stopped what I was saying. I was just like, and I, 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 I couldn't leave. It was like 30 minutes later before I finally came out of it. And then it was like, okay, you know, that was the most awesome thing I've ever experienced. Where'd you go? <laughs> I wanted him to come back. But we can experience his love. Hallelujah. It's a call to understanding the deep things of God, not just the surface stuff, not just to think of, you know, uh, oh, well, you know, yeah, God loves me. What can I? No, he wants you to understand the deep things of God, how he feels. That's what we were going over today, the deep things of the Lord, how the Lord loves you and how he wants to interact with you and how he wants to be with you. He wants to be with you constantly, always. And it's a revelation to those of us whom he longs to reveal his heart to. It's a call to know his heart. We want to know God's heart. You want to know God's heart. And if you want to know his heart, just seek him. He'll tell you. He'll show you. And it's a, it's a, it's a call to have oil in our lamps to be ready. Because we could be ready. We need to be ready at a moment's notice. And when you seek out the Lord, your, your lamp will get filled. You'll have a lot of oil. You'll get a lot of anointing. Trust me. You'll get filled up to full to pretty much overflowing. I guarantee you that. Hallelujah. And to seek him daily. Seek that anointing daily. Stir that spirit up. That's what David did, right? He stirred himself up in the spirit of God. I mean, there was a time in Ziglag when everybody wanted to wipe out David, but he stirred himself up. And he went to the Lord and he came out victorious. Hallelujah. Seek him daily. It's, it's a call to step into your position of privilege. Step into your position of privilege. You're a child of God. You're anointed by God. Think about that. Step into that. That's your privilege. You are in a position of privilege. That's not pride. That's knowing who you are in God. Hallelujah. Do you have this desire? It's so important for us to have this desire in this hour. And I end by asking you a question. Do you remember your first love? You first, you know, the, the first time you met your wife, when before, just, just as she became a, a, a bride, but just before you, you, you got engaged. You, know, you had to call her all the time. You had to be around her all the time. You're, you're writing love letters. You know, it's like, 
You're looking for excuses just to talk to her. You know, you're just like, oh, I, I want to speak to her. I, I want to speak to her. I want to, I want to talk to, I want to talk to him. Oh, but I don't know what to do. Oh yeah, uh, listen, um, uh, I, I can't go right now because I got a, I got a hair appointment. <laughs> Meanwhile, I forget that I'm bald. You know. But you talk to her every day. You talk to him every day. How many times a day do you speak? You would see each other as often as you can, using your excuses to get that person. You would, do a free, you would do frequent dates. You would always be calling up and going out on special dates. You know, oh, I'm going to take you out to dinner. I'll take you here. Oh, you know, I really like to see this thing. Psh, done. I mean, my, I hate operas. Oh, I'd love to go see an opera. I want to go see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Let's go. You do anything for her. This is, this is, you couldn't stop talking about your new love. Everyone's tried hearing you to speak about that person. You, you write the love letters. You do, the older generations write the, the love letters. The newer generation uses text, Snapchat, Facebook, you know, whatever it is to try to keep in touch with that person. But hallelujah. But he's a great bridegroom. Today, Jesus wants you to be his Valentine. By renewing your heart to cultivating those same feelings and emotions for Jesus, even greater emotions need to be stirred up within your life. He is the great bridegroom. You are the bride. You are the bride's long dress. If you think about it, you know, you ever take like a snowball, right? You make a snowball. Just think about what makes up that snowball. Not one snowflake is the same. They're all different. Every single snowflake is different. But yet when you bring them all together, it makes this beautiful snowball. Or it even makes this beautiful blanket of snow. When you look out in the trees, you know, like this morning when I woke up, I was like, oh, it looks beautiful out there. Now, if you have one little snowflake, that don't look like much of anything. But when you have all of this snow, all different people, all different walks of life, right? And it makes this beautiful blanket. That's us. We're the bride. We make up the, the, the bride's, it's almost like the bride's dress. Hallelujah. Now that's intimacy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you feel the same feelings for Jesus and everything through the eyes of a bride? Do you see the same things? Church, this is, this is the whole crux of the message this morning, is that God created marriage not just for, you know, uh, to, for us to appropriate, I mean, you know, that is what he wants to do. He wants us to keep creating the same image for us. But it's really about relationship. It's about the husband and wife relationship, the bride the bridegroom's relationship. And when you start looking at the word like that, you start seeing things like even in Hosea, how a bad marriage was won over by love. Or if you look in the Songs of Solomon, you know, I mean, that's a real sensual book and, and but if you look at it through the bride's eyes you realize that it's the church about jesus that's what that book is talking about you know hosea uh, was the first one to proclaim about the the bride and bridegroom theory and so was and jeremiah was the, was the second one and, and you see it in the beginning i mean it's all through scripture when you start looking at at jesus through the eyes of a bride and him as a bridegroom then you start to really understand what the relationship is all about Praise God. Hallelujah. And so as our, as our, uh, our band comes back to the altar, uh, well, I want to just close. Is there anyone here that doesn't know the bridegroom? Is there anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life so they can't get that opportunity until you know him? You, don't, you can't understand the things of, of the Lord. You can't understand God's love for you unless you know him. And the only way you're going to know him, Jesus said it, is nobody gets to the Father but by me. Amen. Jesus is the only way. So I'm going to ask, is there anyone here that would like to give their hearts to Jesus? Please stand up, and I'll pray for you. I will pray for anyone who wants to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to take a moment here. Praise God. Everybody here knows the Lord. Everybody here knows the Lord. That is so awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Now I just want to pray, is there anybody here that needs prayer? Anybody that needs prayer, maybe their relationship with God isn't so hot right now, or maybe uh, there's, there's things going on in your life that you know are wrong and you just want to get rid of it. Uh, whatever it may be, you know, you want to draw closer to Jesus. If that's you, please come on up to the altar. I'm going to open up those, the altars for, for prayer. For anybody that wants to give, uh, that wants to, uh, you know, relinquish things that are going on in their life that they're not very happy with, please come to the front. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. All right. Well, 
The band is going to give us one song, and then uh, everybody will be dismissed once the song is over. But praise the Lord. Thank you for coming this morning. You guys are diehards. It makes my heart happy to see you here this morning.